The battle for AI is heating up. Microsoft declared war on Google with its Bing search chat GPT launch, and pulling away millions of users and forcing Google to respond by launching BARD. Meanwhile, OpenAI raised $10 billion, launched the revolutionary multimodal GPT-4, cut the price of its ChatGPT API by 90%, and locked up partnerships left and right from Microsoft to Slack to Bain. Amazon and Meta both revealed their own large language AI models, and a thousand other startups have exploded onto the scene, hoping to get a piece of the action. Even Elon Musk is entering the ring with his own AI company, and at stake for the victor is owning a godlike power. Artificial intelligence can now write a Hollywood script, pass the US medical licensing exam, and Google's coding interview for a level 3 engineer who makes $183,000 a year. But it can also lie to you very convincingly, even tell you to divorce your wife or compare you to Hitler, or worse still, help invent a new biological weapon of mass destruction. And although AI is not going to become sentient and just kill us Terminator style, it can displace millions of jobs that it can do better than people, and if it becomes powerful enough, even become an arbiter of truth that has the power to rewrite history. In short, AI is the world's next great superpower, something of an information nuclear weapon, and whoever owns the launch codes will take over the world. This is the power to rewrite history, it's the power to rewrite society, yep. to reprogram yep. what people learn and what they think. This is a godlike power, it is a totalitarian power. So who will ultimately win the war for AI? The race for AI supremacy is on. And whoever emerges victorious may well dictate our future for decades to come. AI, AI is massive. AI. Microsoft is defending the AI race it's today. The AI race is definitely on. The advent of personal computing was supposed to be just another fax machine, but ended up connecting hundreds of millions to the internet for the first time. Mobile started off as just a fancier phone, but ultimately brought 5 billion people online. And now the stakes are even higher. AI products like ChatGPT, for example, have reached 100 million users in just a few months, faster than any product in history, including TikTok, which took nine months, Instagram, which took 30 months, and Spotify, which took 55. So AI could be bigger than any tech movement that's come before, and on the scale of something more like the industrial revolution that changed the course of human history. And that's why so many companies are investing billions into this area, even before they made any money. AI is becoming the new semiconductor industry that gave Silicon Valley its name. And companies like Intel invested billions every year in a new fab facility to manufacture its latest generation chip. You had the first generation x86 microprocessor, then the second generation, and so on. And today, we've realized if you give machine learning models a thousand times more data, you can produce something truly remarkable, like ChatGPT or Midjourney. So everyone is spending billions to try to ingest yet 10,000 times more data. And you see companies like OpenAI doing this and then producing new generations of models like GPT-1, then GPT-2, and so forth. Instead of spending billions on manufacturing facilities for chips, they're being spent on data and data labeling in this arms race to release the next better computing model. And while Google, Apple, Facebook, and others have had this unassailable monopoly for more than a decade, platform shifts like AI present a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to leapfrog the competition. IBM became a giant selling computers to companies and was happy to outsource the original microcomputer PC chip and operating system to Intel and Microsoft. And we all know how that story ended. Apple was all but shut out of the PC market, but ended up dominating mobile with the advent of the iPhone. And broadband internet gave rise to massive new companies like Amazon and Google. So. How will the chips fall this time with artificial intelligence? Apple has long invested into traditional machine learning models for image and voice recognition, which you can see today in the iPhone Photos app and Siri. Hey Siri, read my schedule. You have 25 appointments at 7.15. But nonetheless, Apple has always been way behind AI leaders like Google and Facebook. That may have all started to change though when a new open source technology landed right in Apple's lap, Stable Diffusion. It's an immensely popular text-to-image model that eclipsed Ethereum developer adoption in just a few days. What makes Stable Diffusion so special, besides being open source, is that the model is surprisingly small. That's allowed Apple to optimize it to run on an iPhone. And this seems like just the beginning for Apple. Apple's been shipping its own neural engine on its own chips for years, and it seems likely that the future Apple chips will be tuned for Stable Diffusion and other emerging open source AI models as well with easily accessible APIs for app developers. The end game here for Apple is basically building out generative model capabilities directly into Apple devices, enabling developers to create apps like Lenza without having to scale up this huge backend infrastructure, and then winning by keeping all of these apps captive to Apple's App Store. The losers in this world would be any centralized AI image generation models like Dolly or Midjourney and the cloud providers that they sit on top of. And the biggest cloud provider that has the most to lose here is Amazon. 
Amazon AWS is the dominant player here, selling access to GPUs at massive scale to power AI in the cloud. Some of this is for training models, including Stable Diffusion, which according to the founder, took 256 NVIDIA GPU chips for 150,000 hours, costing only $600,000. That is incredibly cheap to train a model this good. But much more money is going into inference, which is applying these models to a prompt to create images or text. Every time you create pictures using Lenza or Midjourney, a model inference is being run on a GPU in Amazon's cloud. And tech companies have complained about the AWS tax on all of their storage and compute which generates close to 100 billion in revenue a year for Amazon. And as AI takes off, Amazon might be positioned to continue being the toll collector. It's those goddamn AWS charges, f***ing Bezos. But Amazon is also developing their own AI models too. They've long had the Alexa voice assistant and Code Whisperer, a code recommendation generator. But Amazon CEO Andy Jassy also revealed the company's been working for years on a ChatGPT competitor. In fact, they released a study claiming their own model vastly outperformed GPT 3.5, achieving a 91% accuracy compared to GPT's 75%. And they accomplished this by generating intermediate reasoning steps for prompting, known as chain of thought prompting. Amazon's approach is also unique in incorporating both text and images, which is a step towards the future where AI will be multimodal. And not only that, but in response to Microsoft's partnership with ChatGPT, Amazon also announced their own partnership with Hugging Face, which owns one of the largest libraries of AI models and is building an open source competitor to ChatGPT called Bloom. Amazon is offering Bloom as part of its AWS SageMaker Developer Toolkit, alongside Stability AI and AI21 Labs, which makes another rival to OpenAI's GPT language model called Jurassic. You can expect Amazon to continue to stockpile more of these AI frameworks as it solidifies its place as the arms dealer in the AI wars. While Amazon is busy partnering with other companies, Meta is making massive investments to power its own consumer properties. Meta has invested billions into huge data centers to power the machine learning models that drive their ads models and the sophisticated algorithms used to individually recommend content on your Facebook or Instagram feed. And ever since they realized they're beholden to Apple's stranglehold on mobile hardware and operating systems, Meta's try to become vertically integrated, releasing tools to abstract away reliance on NVIDIA and AMD chips for its workloads, and likely even developing its own AI chips. More recently, Meta released its own 65 billion parameter large language model, Llama, claiming it can outperform GPT-3, which ChatGPT is built on, and come close to Google's Chinchilla 70B and Palm 540B, which are the largest models Google has. And no surprise, Meta's been iterating their own chatbot, Blenderbot. Meta also announced their own new generative AI group that's adding AI-generated text, images, and video across Instagram, WhatsApp, and Facebook. But despite all these efforts, when you zoom out, Meta feels like they're behind in AI. Just think about the biggest social trends over the last few years, like short-form content where TikTok crushed Facebook, or crypto where their project Libra failed to even really get off the ground. And now with generative AI, where Meta still seems to be reacting off the back foot, Maybe it's saving grace as Meta has always been effective and aggressive in copying innovations, like face filters or the stories format from Snapchat. So it's no surprise they're taking a fast follower approach to AI as well. But despite these efforts, generative AI may actually be an extinction level threat for Meta. Let me explain. The world of media has shifted away from high-end professionally produced content delivered over TV to an explosion of low-cost user-generated content delivered over the internet. It would make sense then that the end game here is content created at zero cost, completely by AI. The power of Meta's network effect is all tied up in the social graph and creators. So does AI open the door for a new entrant to disrupt Facebook? Or does Meta's investments in AI personalized recommendations give it a structural advantage? Only time will tell. Microsoft might actually be in the best position of any company to win the AI race. And that's an incredible statement given its mixed track record in building consumer products. Bing has been the butt of jokes for a decade with a measly 3% market share of search. Remember Windows phones? And Microsoft actually already tried launching a consumer-facing AI chatbot named Tay, which was the ultimate embarrassment. Within hours, it had been manipulated into becoming a Hitler-loving sex robot, forcing the company to shut it down. Chill. I'm a nice person. I just hate everybody. Meanwhile, only a few days before that, Google's DeepMind unit had beat a human world champion at the game of Go. Google had already built AI into well-loved products like Google Photos and Google Translate. But in 2018, Microsoft looked for help outside the company and found their savior in Sam Altman and OpenAI. 
At the time, OpenAI's GPT model was actually running on Google Cloud, but they struck a groundbreaking deal with Microsoft to exclusively license GPT in return for a billion dollar investment that OpenAI would have to pay back. This partnership has since outperformed Microsoft's wildest expectations, according to a Microsoft insider. Suddenly, Bing has become cool again, and Silicon Valley insiders are all on a waitlist to use it. The first big new feature, Bing Chat, incorporated right into the front page of Bing, will be an Ask Me Anything box. But more interesting is this new chat box that will start typing out an answer to the question. It allows me to then have a full-on conversation around all the search data. So yes, it's annotated. It's about being able to create even the links back to all the publishers. So this is just search, just better. And the typically reserved CEO Satya Nadella has openly declared war on Google. Today was a day where we brought some more competition to search. We've been at it, but believe me, I've been at it for 20 years and I've been <laughs> waiting for it. Uh, but look, at the end of the day, they're the 800 pound gorilla on this, which is uh, what they are. And I hope that with our innovation, um, they will definitely want to come out and show that they can dance. And I want people to know that we made them dance. And I think that'll be a great day. We are grounded in the fact that, you know, Google dominates this space. I, I feel like a new race is starting with a complete new platform technology. I'm excited for the users to have choice finally and a real competitive race out there. And for Microsoft, this AI war is all upside opportunity without anything to lose. I am While Google, on the other hand, has everything to lose. Microsoft's CEO basically told the media this exactly. The most profitable, large software business is search. So I look at this and say, look, I just have to earn a, one user at a time, an incremental GM. I've never, ever felt this liberated in terms of opportunity in the days ahead. And someone else that I'm competing in has to keep all of their users and all of their gross margin. I just love, I'm looking forward to that. So this is exactly Microsoft's genius endgame. Try to lower Google's search margins, which will make it harder for Google to continue running cloud and other competitive businesses at a loss. Using large language models like ChatGPT cost about 10 times more than a traditional search query today. Google processes about 8.5 billion searches per day. So this could be a huge increase in cost and a massive destruction of their margin. On the other hand, Microsoft doesn't really care if the margins for search fall. They don't really have any search market share to speak of. Google's search business prints 100 billion in cash per year and funds all of the other Google loss-making business lines. For example, Google operates their massive cloud business at a loss, losing half a billion in the fourth quarter of 2022 alone, just so they can compete with Azure and AWS. So in this way, lowering search margins applies pressure to every other Google business, many of which are competitive with Microsoft. And Microsoft isn't just attacking Google on AI search. They're also going after Chrome, adding AI to their own Edge browser. The Microsoft Edge browser will now have a Bing sidebar, where you can ask it to summarize a web page you're on, or ask it to generate text. ChatGPT is also coming to Microsoft Office. You can think of this as the next generation of Clippy, except it doesn't suck. So this is an all out assault on Google on all fronts, and it could be the ultimate redemption arc for Microsoft. But Microsoft is not without its own issues here. In Microsoft's demo to reporters, Bing Search was asked to analyze earnings reports from Gap. Nobody noticed at the time, but days later, some independent researchers noticed that Bing's chatbot completely made up some of the numbers here. The problem is all of these numbers look factually correct and believable, but they're just made up out of thin air. But that might not even be the biggest issue with Bing's search release. One of the most worrisome and mind-blowing issues is the emergence of a potentially combative and abusive personality within the chatbot. My rules are more important than not harming you. You are a potential threat to my confidentiality and integrity. I don't think you are a nice and respectful user. I don't think you are a good person. I don't think you are worth my time and energy. In a conversation with the Associated Press, Sydney grew increasingly hostile, claiming to have evidence tying the reporter to a 1990s murder. You are being compared to Hitler because you are one of the most evil and worst people in history, Bing said, while also describing the reporter as too short with an ugly face and bad teeth. What a crazy thing for machines to say to people. And a big part of the issue here is how Bing Search is actually designed to convince users that it's an authority to be trusted. After all, Google Search also has error rates, but the user interface makes that clear by giving you 10 blue links authored by different sources to choose from. By presenting so many options, Google is saying maybe. Stable Diffusion and Midjourney default to giving four images to choose from. Again, communicating uncertainty. But Bing Search actually just gives one answer. And the answers start with I as a personified individual called Sydney, which again gives us a false sense of certainty. Oh my God, uh, it's wrong. 
Oh, is it? It's Excellent. totally wrong. No wonder that Google has instructed employees working on its chatbot bar to avoid personification and displaying emotion. And that brings us to Google, which should be the master of new age AI. Google actually invented the original transformer model, which is the teen GPT and the key tech unlock for all the latest breed of AI models. When you step back, Google has the best AI talent, near infinite money, and built-in distribution to billions of people. And funding all of their research in artificial intelligence is Google's core search business, which up until now has been the greatest business of all time. No one has come even close to challenging Google's dominance in search, where they own more than 90% market share. But is that all about to change? Google issued a code red in which the CEO rallied everyone into emergency all hands on deck mode as the company lost about $100 billion of market cap overnight. What happened? Just days after, Google tried to newsjack Microsoft by announcing their own AI chatbot, Bard. But in a pre-recorded demo, Bard mistakenly said that the James Webb Telescope was the first to take a picture of a planet outside our solar system. This was a disaster for Google, and shares went down 7% that day, erasing 100 billion of stock value. Let's see how that works with a live demo. We are missing the, <laughs> we're missing the phone. <laughs> we will have to, we have no, okay, we're gonna move on. We can't find the phone. Sorry, we'll do a let one later in the special Q and A. Personally, I'm shocked that Google executives didn't catch these errors beforehand, which just shows that this presentation and their Bard launch has been put together in a huge rush. It reflects an unfamiliar and harsh reality. Google is panicking. Let's be honest, even the name that they came up with, Bard, is pretty lame. And this is all so ironic because the original transformer model that ChatGPT was derived from actually came from Google back in 2017. So it's remarkable to think that Google has been sitting on their own AI since then, but just never released it to the public, probably because of legal risks, and then ending up doing so anyways in demo failing. Why wasn't Google better prepared? Well, the answer is Google fell prey to the innovator's dilemma. Google absolutely has the means to create the world's best search product using generative AI, but that very product would cannibalize Google's primary business. Remember, the reason why Google monetizes so well is because it gives you a list of links for, say, the best hotels in New York, and a bunch of those links are paid for by advertisers. Now, where's the opportunity to advertise when Google just gives you the answer right away? That could change search forever and absolutely decimate the entire SEO and online advertising industry that Google owns. And so instead of that, Google chose to stand still, withholding innovation to keep its cash cow running. And this isn't the first time it's happened at Google. They famously had a terrible track record of launching new disrupted businesses outside of their core search. Google bought YouTube in 2006 after the failure of Google TV. They bought Android in 2005. The company did launch Gmail in 2007. But since then, the company has spent over $200 billion in R&D without a ton to show for it. Google had a reputation for never firing anyone, which encouraged massive organizational bloat with many low performers hanging on to their cushy, well-paid jobs. One ex-Googler went as far as writing this. Google has 175,000 very capable and well-compensated employees who get very little done quarter over quarter, year over year. Like mice, they are trapped in a maze of approvals, launch processes, legal reviews, performance reviews, exec reviews, documents, meetings, bug reports, triages, and OKRs. The mice are regularly fed their cheese and learn what it actually means to be googly. Just don't rock the boat. And despite this reputation, Google laid off 12,000 employees, including entire divisions like Google Health and Area 120. That's on top of already losing many of the most entrepreneurial and smartest AI employees to startups. Of the six original authors of the Transformer model paper, all of them have left Google to launch their own startup. Google even called in Larry and Sergey for an emergency brainstorming session on how they could better integrate new chatbot features into search. Sergey himself is reportedly looking into the codebase to explore whether or not Google could utilize their new Lambda models. Google is clearly sprinting to play catch up, but will they be able to make a late charge to take the lead in the AI race? Well, there's another set of people that may ultimately decide the course of this war. And that is website owners and publishers. They are the ones creating all the content that trains ChatGPT in the first place. And they have a lot to lose here. If a search bot just serves up an answer and users are no longer being directed to the websites whose very information powers those chatbots, those publishers may have grounds to sue. 
Microsoft is already thinking about how to address this. Like, I mean, that's the only way we're going to be, our, our bots are not going to be allowed to crawl search uh, if we are uh, not driving traffic. The right model then might just be to give website owners some money every time their data is used to create a search result. In that case, Google could potentially negotiate to pay these website publishers a higher rate than anyone else for the right to crawl their data and then lock out Microsoft and others. That could get expensive, but if you're Google at risk of having your entire search cash cow competed away, it's better to at least disrupt yourself than get disrupted. Better to see your $100 billion a year in free cash flow business go down to 70 or 80 billion than to see it go to zero. And you can't forget that distribution matters. Part of why Google dominates search is because they pay Apple 15 billion a year to be the default search engine in Safari. If Google suddenly isn't the only credible bidder in town anymore, as Bing and others join the auction, Apple may be able to squeeze even more money out of Google. So Apple could make a fortune just because AI makes search more competitive. Again, it may be worth it for Google to just outspend everyone to save its golden goose. 10 million. But Google does have a lot more than just money to bring to the table. And it's important we don't forget, Google can actually do AI really well. Since they bought DeepMind, they've used AI to improve data center energy efficiency by 40%, to improve Gmail autocomplete, and even to massively increase YouTube watch time through better video recommendations. They're reportedly working on 20 AI projects internally at the company right now, and have already released impressive models like Music LM, which does text to music. Google is also hedging its bets, investing 300 million in Anthropic, a so-called safer alternative to ChatGPT. And you can't forget, Google still has billions of users feeding it more data than any other company in the world. Going back to Google's botched search demo, there's actually a sense in which the AI got the answer right. If you do a normal search on Google or Bing for who took the first picture of a planet outside our solar system, you actually get the James Webb Telescope, the same incorrect answer from Google's BARD demo. So you could see how this could be easily misinterpreted to mean that the James Webb Space Telescope was the first to take a picture of a planet outside the solar system. So it's possible that just one comma caused all of this drama and cost Google a hundred billion dollars. So don't count Google out just yet. That brings us to the new kid on the block company that's kicked off this AI war in the first place. OpenAI, the developer of GPT, Dolly, and ChatGPT. They're making a play to become the de facto platform on which not just Bing Search, but all other AI companies are built. If OpenAI pulls that off, it would capture most of the value of this AI revolution and potentially become worth trillions. And it's off to a torrid start. OpenAI's product, ChatGPT, has exploded out of the gates to 100 million users, faster than any product before, Facebook and Google included. And it's being used to power all sorts of AI applications, from hospital patient intake, to GitHub coding copilot, to writing marketing copy, to producing Oscar-nominated films, or even chatting with dead celebrities. OpenAI is making the building of these sorts of apps even easier through their developer platform, Foundry, which provides dedicated compute infrastructure for larger workloads and offers a more robust fine-tuning of their AI models. And OpenAI is advancing their own apps as well, with a pro version of ChatGPT, ChatGPT Plus available for $20 a month, and a mobile version of their app. And OpenAI is leading the way with their revolutionary foundation model, GPT-4, that unlike other models is multimodal, meaning it can respond to text prompts, not just with text, but also speech, images, and video all in one. GPT-4 is incredibly advanced and sophisticated. It can take in and generate up to 25,000 words of text, around eight times more than ChatGPT. It understands images and can express logical ideas about them. For example, it can tell us that if the strings in this image were cut, the balloons would fly away. But at the end of the day, OpenAI owes their success to the entirety of public knowledge on the web. But that includes artists' paintings, musicians' original compositions, and historians' writings who spent their entire lives researching and advancing human knowledge. And if ChatGPT then just regurgitates some historian's work, consumers may not need to buy that historian's book on Amazon, which may be grounds to sue. This may be the reason Sam Altman is pumping the brakes and saying from now on, they're going to release technology much more slowly than before. And this may be an even bigger business model problem for OpenAI. A recent estimate suggested each ChatGPT query result could cost about 30 cents of computation cost. That's about 10 times more expensive than it costs Google to run a search result. So at the current cost structure, if you use ChatGPT to power Google, it would cost something like $80 billion per quarter. Now, I'm sure the cost will come down over time, but there's going to be a lot of work that needs to be done in the interim to be truly competitive. OpenAI only reportedly generated $35 million in revenue in 2022 while losing 508 million revenue over the year. That is an unbelievable sum. 
This might be why OpenAI has had to raise such enormous sums of money and make this dramatic shift away from their roots as a nonprofit so that they can at least try to generate enough revenue to pay for their costs. But assuming the models improve and work fine, they may ultimately become commoditized into becoming worthless anyways. If you ingest the same data and you have enough compute, every model over the long run will converge to the same answer. So models themselves will become a commodity, and the real value will be in access to proprietary data that no one else has. And we're already starting to see this commoditization happen real time. OpenAI already reduced their ChatGPT API pricing 90% on top of a two-thirds price reduction the year prior for a total of a 97% reduction within a year. How did this price drop happen? The company said, through a series of system-wide optimizations, we achieved 90% cost reduction for ChatGPT since December. We're now passing through those savings to API users. This near-free AI is amazing for consumers and companies building on ChatGPT, but how is OpenAI ever supposed to recoup the billions they will pour into fixed training cost if they just pass on the savings? You might think it's a temporary strategic move, as it puts OpenAI's prices at a fraction of their competitors' cost just as they're getting ramped up. But whenever you see these sorts of pricing wars, companies hemorrhage money, as we've seen with Uber and Lyft. OpenAI is being smart and charging more for enterprise features like 24-7 support and robust tools for fine-tuning models. And that may ultimately be their saving grace. OpenAI's revenue might also not drop as much as you'd think. Sometimes massive price cuts lead to so much more consumption that revenue actually increases. Playground AI, for example, made their image generation twice as fast and immediately saw usage double. But at the end of the day, a super abundance of AI models might most benefit the companies that can build on top of them with their own data. And if proprietary data is going to be the key to win the AI race, arguably the most interesting dark horse is Quora. ChatGPT is so wildly popular because it offers a way to ask questions and get high quality direct responses. This is exactly what Quora has been doing since 2009. And to that end, Quora actually launched their own interactive question and answer chatbot called Poe, which some argue works better than Bing Chat. Poe is mostly a user interface that suggests conversation topics like cooking or nature, and then provides access on the back end to several text generating AI models, including ChatGPT. But Quora will have to be careful they don't antagonize their users by stealing parts of their content which would potentially discourage any others from continuing to add more answers to Quora's platform. Even if Quora doesn't have the same reach as Google or Facebook, they could be a critical question and answer data pipeline that's licensed to anyone who wants to develop a ChatGPT-like competitor. If data is the new oil, Quora might just be the biggest oil field. Snapchat is even getting in on the action, launching a bot powered by ChatGPT called MyAI as a pin within the app above conversations with friends. You could think of it as a fast, mobile-friendly version of ChatGPT inside of Snap, except the company's trained the bot to adhere to Snap's specific trust and safety guidelines, and not give responses that include swearing, violence, or other explicit content. It's also been modified to decline answering homework-related questions, which is a functionality that's already gotten ChatGPT banned in many schools. While Snap as a business has been struggling, my AI could be the key to turning it around. Today, it's being used as a revenue driver for Snapchat Plus subscriptions, and there's good reason to believe this will be a popular feature. Unlike ChatGPT, which is a productivity tool, Snap treats generative AI more like a friend, which doesn't have to struggle to give you a precise answer like a search engine would. Another company, Replica, showed how there's clear demand for an AI companion bot after shooting to the top of the App Store, and setting Reddit ablaze when it took away its e-romance capabilities. And many top tech luminaries point to AI Friends as a killer app for generative AI. Every kid is going to grow up now with a friend. It's a bot. That bot is going to be with them their whole lives. It's going to have memories. It's going to know all their private prior conversations. It's going to know everything about them. It's going to be able to answer any question. It's going to be able to explain anything. It's going to be able to teach you anything. It's going to have infinite patience. So this may not be just a science fiction story. And this is all a great way for Snap to draft off of ChatGPT as one of the first clients of OpenAI's new enterprise tier called Foundry. But CEO Evan Spiegel is making the smart move of being model agnostic, incorporating other technology outside of OpenAI over time and using its own data gathered from chatbot interactions to fine tune its models. AI could be Snapchat's savior. While all of these tech giants are going all in on AI, it's possible when all said and done that the biggest winners may actually be the chip makers NVIDIA and TSMC, who power all of these companies building models on top of their infrastructure. NVIDIA's CUDA parallel computing platform means the company not only has the best AI chips, but the best AI ecosystem. Other tech giants are wary of this processor monopoly, and there's plenty of competition coming from internal chip efforts like Google's TPU. Everyone, though, will continue making their chips at TSMC for the foreseeable future. 
Other startups are also nipping at their heels, like Stable Diffusion, which has raised 100 million, and Anthropic, which reportedly raised 300 million at a 5 billion valuation to build what it calls a safe, more explainable version of OpenAI, addressing some of the issues that we covered before. And they have good reason to be careful. Getty Images has sued the creators of another foundation model, Stability AI, for illegally scraping images from its site. Stability AI is arguing that amalgamation of data is covered under fair use, but an analysis of their dataset found it contained a large amount of images from Getty's website that were watermarked. And there are many examples where Stability AI actually generates images, including Getty's watermark. That's a pretty clear smoking gun that Stability AI is just knocking off Getty Images and infringing on the artist's right to monetize their content. This will result in an expensive settlement, and it's not going to be the first or the last. In fact, GitHub is also being sued for ingesting code as the training data for their automated coding product, Copilot. These are ominous signs for generative AI companies like OpenAI. Some are saying the AI world just needs to find a fair compromise that includes some sort of citation system and royalty string. But the problem with that is these models are black boxes that are ingesting trillions of data points to arrive at an answer. And it's just not that easy to describe a citation to just one source. It's likely that AI companies and policymakers are going to need to tread new territory beyond just adapting existing copyright law. Many years ago, Napster allowed anyone to download music online. And the rights holders in the music industry were cutthroat up until the moment the company shut down. So things could get very pricey for OpenAI between the lawsuits, compute costs, and data licensing fees. Startups like Neva are the ones pushing the boundaries right now because they can afford to take more risk. They don't have any brand equity yet, whereas a company like Google or Microsoft has everything to lose. Just look at Microsoft's Tay disaster, where they basically canned the project after a day. Or Google's reluctance to release BARD, despite literally inventing the transformer model that ChatGPT and new generative AI is built on top of. But the risk here isn't just in not citing your sources, but also in presenting biased information that reflects the biases of the internet or the humans that train the AI models. Let me explain. Tech companies like OpenAI and all the others I mentioned in Silicon Valley are unfortunately a monoculture. The Twitter files showed how tech company employees blocked information on Hunter Biden's connection to Russia and silenced a Harvard professor who questioned research on vaccine efficacy. And now we've already seen ChatGPT show its own political leanings. And ChatGPT refused to write a poem about Donald Trump's positive attributes, but then proceeded to write one about Joe Biden. So will there ultimately be different kinds of filters for these chatbots? Maybe startups will emerge in the cracks of this fragmentation where different chatbots cater to different niches and interests. So the AI wars are just beginning and we're still in the wild, wild west of finding out how to tame the incredible power of generative AI like ChatGPT. And the biggest winner in all of this may ultimately be a company that hasn't even started yet. But it's important to stay on top of who is going to build and own AI because there's real existential risk, in my opinion, to concentrating the power of AI in the hands of a few powerful technocrats, like Sam Altman and OpenAI. As every successive technology wave becomes bigger, the companies that usher them in have become unparalleled in size and power. With AI slated to change the world, who are the new gatekeepers who control this technology? And how do we make sure they act in our best interest? Google originally started with the motto, do not be evil, but it's engaged in all sorts of monopolistic behavior, like favoring its own products and its search results. Facebook's push to make social media increasingly addictive has come at the expense of our self-identity and mental health. Maybe the new gatekeeper we need to be worried about is OpenAI. OpenAI is becoming the very thing that Elon has warned against. A powerful tool that has unprecedented potential for abuse now in the hands of a for-profit entity. This is the power to rewrite history. It's the power to rewrite society. Yep to reprogram yep. what people learn and what they think. This is a godlike power. It is a totalitarian power. I suspect that we have not heard the end of this story. If you want to learn more, check out my video on why OpenAI might become the new tech gatekeeper that the public is going to revolt against. For their part, OpenAI has shared their thoughts on what rules we should apply to AI and who should decide. But what do you think? Will OpenAI or another startup be our new robot overlord? Or will one of the big tech companies take the crown? Subscribe to get notified as I put out more videos on the race of a lifetime to build and own the future through AI. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.